वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अपर्णा वाटवे फैकल्टी ऑफ टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी विल लुक एट इंडियन एक्ट्स एंड पॉलिसीज फॉर वाइल्ड लाइफ कॉन्जर्वेशन दिस इज पार्ट ऑफ पेपर एनवायरमेंट एंड सोसाइटी इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी विल लुक एट वेरियस एक्ट्स फॉर वाइल्ड लाइफ कॉन्जर्वेशन इन इंडिया वी विल लुक एट देर हिस्ट्री and we will also look at the latest policy of wildlife management in the end we will discuss what has been the effect on people of all these acts and policies india is a mega diversity country we have more than 14000 flowering plants in india there are more than 90000 animals which live in india the great diversity of habitats in india is a matter of pride to us we have dense forest great deserts vast grasslands we also have tall mountains and deep oceans coral reefs mangrove forest are some of the very special ecosystems but along with this we also have a population of more than billion people they live together with the plants and animals and share the same habitats coexistence of all these groups is possible only through special efforts wildlife protection act in 1972 was created to ensure protection of plants animals and their habitats it laid down certain common guidelines which are supposed to be followed by all indians the act extends to the whole of india except the state of jammu and kashmir this state has its own wildlife act india has a long history of animal protection laws the first wildlife laws in india were enacted during the year 1887 by the british government that law was titled the wild birds protection act of 1887 that act was mainly to control hunting of game birds during the breeding season it applied only to a few parts of british india later this was followed by the wild birds and animals protection act of 1912 this act was made applicable throughout british india hunting was very common in india local communities regularly hunted for food the indian kings and rich people hunted as a sport hunting was a favorite pastime of british many hunters came to india specifically for shooting tiger elephants and rhinoceros there are records that thousands of birds were killed for sport at one time many tigers were shot in india and their skins and heads were proudly displayed in houses and museums there was a need to regulate hunting on such a large scale in the 1935 wild birds and animals protection amendment act of 1935 was enforced hunting did not reduce by this laws but it was regulated hunting was considered a noble sport hunters like jim corbett were glorified as killers of man eating tigers and saviors of people even after independence hunting continued hunters wrote popular accounts of hunting and created an image of a brave hunter who fought against wild animals hunting by these recreational hunters was a class apart from hunting by local people local people mainly did it as a support to their nutrition many marginal communities in india have been hunters and gatherers many nomadic communities continued to hunt even today they could survive a very hard life because they had great skills of trapping birds and wild mammals there was a large demand for wild meat and meat products in the domestic market there are many superstitions related to magical 
and medicinal powers of certain animal parts. Tiger claw and bear claw is supposed to give you strength. Meat of monitor lizard was believed to cure many diseases. At this same time, there was great expansion of industry and cities. This led to destruction of most wildlife habitats. Hunting and trade in wildlife was depleting populations of many mammals, birds and reptiles which were already less because of the loss of habitat. The environmental lobby became conscious of these facts and insisted that the law is revised to protect the biodiversity of India. A landmark was reached in Nature Conservation of India in 1972. In this year, India passed the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. This was the first comprehensive legislation for control and management of wildlife and their habitats. The framework of this act was adopted from the Bombay Wild Birds and Animals Protection Act of 1950. This act was framed by famous ornithologist Humayun Abdul Ali of the Bombay Natural History Society. Various amendments have been made in the act from time to time. The last of these was in 2006. It is now known as the Wildlife Protection Amendment Act of 2006. As the years passed, the provisions of the act became more and more strict. The penalties for offences were increased. Various bodies have been constituted to ensure wildlife protection. They are supported by this Wildlife Protection Act. This act is a powerful legal framework for prohibition of hunting of wildlife. We need to understand some terms very clearly if we have to understand this act. Wildlife includes any animal, bees, butterflies, crustaceans, fish and moths and aquatic or land vegetation which forms part of any habitat. Through this act, various types of protected areas are established. In the earlier phases, this act had only two categories of protected areas, wildlife sanctuary and national park. In later phases, two more categories of protected areas are added. One of them is community reserve and the second is conservation reserve. The act also controls regulation and control of trade in parts and products derived from wildlife. This is extremely important provision. There is a great demand for products like horn of rhinoceros, ivory from elephants and handbags and shoes made from snake skins. All these are illegal items. The act also has provision for management of zoos. Central Zoo Authority is constituted under this Act. This authority oversees functioning of all the zoos in India. Zoos are extremely important for educational purpose. But they have animals which are removed from wild. Adequate care is needed to ensure that the populations of wild animals are not threatened because of their collection for the zoos. There are many rules and regulations about how zoo animals should be kept and managed. Breeding of some animals in the zoos is also controlled. The most important definition in the Wildlife Protection Act is that of the word hunting. It is a very complex and comprehensive definition. Hunting covers capturing killing, poisoning, snaring and trapping of wild animals. It includes every attempt to do so. Suppose a person is chasing an animal with hunting dogs. 
the chasing itself is an offense even if the animal is not finally trapped and killed hunting also includes driving any wild animal for a bow purpose driving was a practice of organized hunting it was done by villagers and kings if they wanted to hunt on large scale injuring or destroying or taking any part of the body of any wild animal is an offense in the case of wild birds and reptiles damaging the egg disturbing the egg or nests of birds and reptiles are also equivalent to hunting the act defines animals and it includes amphibians birds mammals reptiles and also their young ones or eggs a person or persons harming or intending to harm any of these even the juveniles or eggs are considered offenders this provision has been very important in recent times there is a rise in wildlife poachers taking away small animals or eggs from wild and selling it abroad for pet trade hunting is permitted only under certain very rare conditions killing or wounding of any wild animal in defense of oneself or of any other persons is not an offense special permissions can be issued for hunting if wild animal has become dangerous to human life or if it has become disabled or deceased beyond recovery in recent times there have been many cases where leopards or bears strayed into human habitation there have been many attacks on humans around some cities in maharashtra in 2003 there were many attacks by leopards on humans and livestock in such rare cases chief wildlife warden of the state can give permission for trapping the animal or euthanizing it if necessary trapping animals for scientific research and management is permitted but it is highly controlled and regulated by the forest department at the end of the act there is a long list of plants and animals they are divided into six categories they are called the schedules of the act act prohibits hunting of all animals listed from schedule 1 to 4 these species are endangered due to illegal trade loss of habitat and poaching schedule 1 contains highly threatened animals like tiger leopard and python schedule 2 contains reptiles and insects these are mainly the ones which have become endangered because of some kind of trade schedule 3 and 4 lists all the other wild animals of india schedule 5 species are classed as vermin permissions for killing are not required if an animal is declared as a vermin common crow rats mice and fruit bats are included in schedule 5 these are pest species killing them is not a wildlife offense in recent times many animals have turned crop raiders nilgai chinkara wild boar and monkeys regularly raid crops in certain areas this leads to large scale crop damage in 2016 there was a need for controlled culling 
of crop raiding nilgai and wild boar in parts of bihar rhesus monkey were causing problems in parts of himachal pradesh ministry of environment and forest approved the declaration of these species as vermin only in that specific area they could have been eliminated but many groups oppose this wildlife scientists believed that it is not a scientific measure to reduce wildlife conflict the conflict can be caused by many factors which include loss of habitat therefore culling them is not an option animal right activist opposed it as it was seen as a cruel measure plants which are protected by wildlife protection act are included in schedule 6 around 25 species are present in schedule 6 this includes lady slipper orchids blue vanda orchid and indian pitcher plant all these are endangered species because of their beauty they are in great demand by gardeners all over the world they have to be protected by law wildlife protection act was drafted with expert advice of the smithsonian institute of america it has provisions for declaring certain areas as protected areas This has been used for setting of national park and wildlife sanctuary. The idea was to help protect different ecosystems as representatives of Indian biodiversity. The act includes procedures that may work against the local communities in this area. In the latest version there is provision for declaring five different types of protected areas. First is the national park they can be notified in areas of ecological faunal floral and geomorphological importance notification involves a long process it has to ensure that all the claims on this land have elapsed all claims on the land intended to be national park are to be disposed of by the state government all rights in proposed area of national parks are vested in the government second category is wildlife sanctuary these are areas of adequate ecological faunal floral geomorphological natural or zoological significance it basically includes all kinds of natural habitats which are home to some protected species first in the process there is declaration of intention to notify wildlife sanctuary boundaries of this area are clearly noted there is a period for hearing claims with regard to people's rights in this area finally the government must settle all claims made in relation to the land tiger reserves are declared by national tiger conservation authority this was part of a centrally sponsored project tiger once the reserve is declared there is no alteration in the boundary without recommendation of national board of wildlife it also has to take advice from the tiger conservation authority national parks and tiger reserves are more strictly protected by law than the sanctuaries they allow no human activity except those for wildlife conservation tourism is allowed only in very specific areas grazing and private tenurial rights are not allowed in national park but such rights can be allowed in sanctuaries at the discretion of chief wildlife warden of the state today after declaration of forest right act the provisions of fra 
can be used to claim rights even in national parks and sanctuaries. Investigation for study, photography, scientific research, tourism and transaction of any legal business with any person in the sanctuary area is possible only with the permission of Chief Wildlife Warden of the state. The new amendment in the Wildlife Protection Act does not allow any commercial extraction of forest produce in both national park and wildlife sanctuary. Local communities can collect forest produce only for their bona fide needs. Wildlife Protection Act contains elaborate procedures for dealing with legal rights in proposed protected areas. Acquisition of land by this law is deemed as an acquisition for public purpose. But after the enactment of Forest Right Act, care is taken to comply with various provisions relating to the community rights. Community reserves and conservation reserves are two new categories of protected areas included in Wildlife Protection Act. Conservation reserves can be declared by the state government in any area owned by the government. This is generally done in areas adjacent to national park and sanctuaries or areas linking two protected areas. Declaration can be made only after consulting with the local communities. Conservation reserves are declared for the purpose of protecting landscapes, seascapes, flora, fauna and their habitats. The rights of the people living inside conservation reserve are not affected. Community reserves can be declared by state government on any private or community land. It can be declared in areas where individual or a community has volunteered to conserve wildlife and its habitat. Community reserves are declared for the purpose of protecting fauna, flora and traditional or cultural conservation values and practices. The rights of people living inside a community reserve are not affected. In both cases, conservation efforts are to be done by the local community themselves. These categories provide a greater role for local communities and civil society organizations. They give us opportunity to protect many areas of high conservation value that cannot be designated under categories such as wildlife sanctuary or national parks. Most often, these areas act as buffer zones or links or migration corridor between other protected areas. The Act also lays down procedures for the appointment of state wildlife authorities and wildlife board. In 2006, Wildlife Crime Control Bureau was constituted to monitor and control the illegal trade in wildlife products. Wild animals and any article derived from them are government property according to the Wildlife Protection Act. Many animal parts are in great demand. There are cultural demands for these products. Ivory is a prized possession. Shahatu shal from wool of chiru deer are in great demand for their beauty. Snake skins were used as luxury items. Snake venom was needed for preparing anti-venom. Horn of rhinoceros, skins of tigers, leopards and many other animals have led to large-scale poaching in recent times. Tigers have been hunted widely for export to other Asian countries. Tiger bone is supposed to have great medicinal values. Large conches, seashells, butterflies and beetles of beautiful colors are all collector's items. They are traded in international collector's groups. 
Today, sand boa snakes and owls are being collected and sold for large sums of money. They are used in practice of black magic. Sale or trade of such items or of live and dead wild animals is prohibited and it invites high penalties. Anyone who keeps animals or such products must hand them over to government. Special permissions to keep them are given to research institutes and museums. No wild mammal, bird, amphibian listed in the four schedules of Wildlife Protection Act can be hunted within or outside of protected areas. Penalty for hunting is imprisonment. It can be anything from 3 to 7 years. The fines range from 10,000 to anything more than that. A National Board for Wildlife is chaired by Prime Minister of India. National Wildlife Action Plan was introduced in 2002. This was in response to priorities being given to commercial use and changing consumer patterns. The action plan emphasized need for people's protection. It talks about conservation of endangered wildlife and controlling trade in wildlife products. The plan contains recommendations to address the needs of local communities. It elaborates need for voluntary relocating and rehabilitation of villages within protected areas. Restoration of degraded habitats outside of protected area is also an objective of the plan. Wildlife and people have coexisted in the Indian landscape for several centuries. Provisions of these acts and policies had a very strong impact on the relationship between humans and wildlife. Large number of communities depend on forest areas. Declaration of protected areas was often done without consulting them or understanding their rights of use. Many people were forcibly evicted from protected areas. There were many conflicts. It propagated a misconception that humans and wildlife cannot coexist. Severe conflicts were seen around all protected areas. Displacement from homes led to impoverishment of many tribal communities. Some communities lived by trading in wildlife. Snake charmers showed snakes. Fasipardis trapped birds and mammals. Makarwalas kept monkeys. Darvesh kept sloth bears. All these were illegal by the law. Livelihoods of these communities were threatened and they did not have enough skills to find alternatives to this livelihood. Wildlife in India continues to degrade for various reasons. In some cases, the act is powerless to stop the destruction. The only option today that we have is bridging the gap between people and wildlife. There is a need to create awareness about how we can coexist in this mega diverse country. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this module. You can read the e-text for further information. You can also take a look at essential readings which gives the main text of the acts. Thank you.